And there's a beautiful African philosophy. It's, it's Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U, Ubuntu. And Nelson Mandela referred to it as the essence of being human. And Archbishop Desmond Tutu spoke of how our personal um, well-being is so deeply connected to the well-being of others. And that's that Ubuntu concept. And every now and then you feel it. Hi there, I'm Bex Craig and you're listening to the Not Just Anything podcast for women who want it whole. I hope you'll join me each week as we hear real stories from real women about how they've curated a whole life by design rather than by default. Today, I speak to the incredibly inspiring Cassandra or Cass Treadwell, who is the co-founder and CEO of So They Can, an international NGO supporting vulnerable communities in East Africa. Cass founded the business, having been profoundly moved by her experiences visiting Africa when she was backpacking in her youth. Her determination, perseverance, and vision really are second to none. And this has driven her to build this phenomenal business that is now supporting over 24,000 children in Kenya and Tanzania across 40 schools. She is a powerhouse, and I can't wait for you to hear not just her story, but also countless stories she shares about people she's met and been inspired by along the way. Get ready, because you'll surely want to follow in her footsteps and change the world. A really big, warm welcome to Cassandra Treadwell, who's joining me from New Zealand today. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Bex. Very good. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation because you have the most incredible story and stories, not just your own, but stories of of lives that you've impacted, of, of people that have also touched and impacted your life. So um, we always get started with, with a big question, which is, you know, who are you after all the things in your life that you've done and, and who you are? Uh, how would you describe yourself? Who are you? I am a New Zealand mother of four, work in the NGO space with uh, the charity So They Can. Perfect. And, and, and yet behind that, there's lots and lots of context and lots of information. So, so they can tell us a little bit more about that organization that you co-founded and that you've been on this amazing journey with for the last 12 years. Is that right? Yeah. God, that makes me old. Um, yes, no, of course. So, um, my background's medical law. So I did my law degree in New Zealand and then I backpack, you know, set off as all Kiwis do on with my backpack when I was early twenties and I went, um, ended up in London and did my master's there in medical law and ethics. Um, and so then I came back after traveling for four or five years to New Zealand and started a career in medical law. So I would work in hospitals um, as their medical legal consultant and uh, working with sort of end of life decision making for patients and liaising with, with the patients and the doctors and then the beginning of life as well. So loved that job, uh, but moved to Australia with my children's father about seven, well, no, probably about 12 years ago now, originally, thinking I could just do the same in-house medical legal work that I did in New Zealand and Australia, but quickly discovered that the hospitals in Australia outsource their medical legal work to big law firms. And I'd done my time as a early lawyer in the big law firms and I didn't want to go back there. So I ended up doing medical legal consultancy, but then dived into the space of um, how I can sort of somehow alleviate the guilt really of the appalling uh, poverty that goes on around the world. So I can remember being up in the middle of the night with my third child then, who was about two months old and feeding him. And I turned on the television and watched that film, Hotel Rwanda. Uh, and it was a very, it's, for those that haven't seen it, it's a very real depiction of the Rwandan genocide that saw a million people murdered in the space of a month, which is actually historically the most people ever killed in that period of time, ever. Uh, and it just really shook me. And uh, I got up the next morning and I sort of went for my run and I can remember thinking, I just have to keep running until I come up with some sort of solution to really alleviate that heaviness of how I had this amazing life and so many through just luck of where they were born did not. So during that time, luckily during that run, (laughs) I just thought of this concept of eat so they can, I called it, which was to hold dinner parties around the world. We all sort of had friends living in different places around the world at that time and just asked them all to bring a donation rather than food. And we ended up raising about $30,000 crazily from that. 
So I took that money over to Africa in 2009 looking for a project to get involved in. I knew Kenya sort of well because I had spent nine months backpacking through Kenya you know, my early 20s, um, and I had a woman I knew in Nairobi who uh, was kind of in the development space. So she took me to various different um, orphanages and schools and then these IDP or internally displaced persons camps. And I would go to each of them and I would say, what do you need? And they'd almost give me a shopping list of maize, beans, corn, mattresses, blankets, and I'd go to the village and I'd buy that stuff and I'd bring it back to the orphanage or the school and I'd say how long would this last and they'd say oh maybe a month and it felt very band-aid it it felt very periphery um and so I really wanted something more sustainable and and sort of that deeper impact uh so then that I ended up visiting a number of these IDP camps so in 2007 ironically very analogous to that Rwandan genocide um that happened in Hotel Rwanda there were about 600,000 Kenyans were displaced in their own country because during the 2007 elections, one tribe had come down and looked to massacre another tribe so they weren't around to vote. So in the west of Kenya, a number of Kiku tribe fled to the east of Kenya and landed in the showgrounds and then the government gave them all, um, well, the actually the United Nations gave them all tents to live in and they became known as the internally displaced persons, so refugees in their own country basically. And I visited a number of those and one of them asked me to build them a school, and that's how it all started. I mean, gosh, uh, it's a huge, like, I know this is just as you just described, just as it, it's getting started, but it, it, even that is, is a lot. And I'm kind of curious, you said you watched this movie, you were obviously really touched by it, and also there must have been something in you that was that was so focused mm-hmm. on making an impact because it's it's a big thing to do to to create all of that form of momentum. So what 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 is it about mm-hmm. supporting and and mm-hmm. empowering people in the world that's so important to you? That's a really good question, actually. It's funny, you know how you do your core values and things, and justice is probably one of mine, and that's probably what led me to do law as well. And I'm really not very academic at all. I love being with people, and I love the tangibility, and I love hearing people's stories and sharing that. And I think that's probably why I gravitated towards medical law, because I was with the patients themselves when they were going through the hardest stages of their lives and their families. And I liked being in their presence and trying to support them while they did that. So I do have that. You're right. I do have that underlying desire to be able to to help people and support them when they're going through very difficult times when I was 16 I um, went and lived in Argentina for a year I did an exchange over there but when I was over there for that year I actually ended up doing some volunteer work in an orphanage and coming from New Zealand where we definitely have our issues but it's they're not sort of um, developing world issues Um, And I'd never worked in an orphanage before. And so that probably really, uh, you know, we saw people begging on the streets and things. And I hadn't experienced that before as a 16-year-old living in New Zealand. And, yeah, it really affected me and it really rocked me. And I knew at that point as well that I wanted to do something in that space for those that through just, just, as I said, being purely um, the luck of where you're born, don't get the same opportunities as the rest of us. I don't know if that answers your question. It absolutely do, it absolutely does, and it's very clear as you describe like justice being something like a taking a stand and sort of like equalizing or trying mm. to equalize a little bit. Mm. Uh, I imagine that that experience in the orphanage, but also going around those camps, mm. uh, take us to those experiences. Like, what was it actually like to see people as you describe refugees in their own country? Mm. What was that experience like? Yeah, it was uh, it was very overwhelming. I had come from uh, countries where there's social welfare systems and where there's no way that what I was seeing would be allowed to happen. Where I lived, you know, children running around sort of in the dirt outside tents um, in the middle of the night and it's freezing um, and... The rain, it's actually people have this misperception that it's very hot in Africa all the time and it's not. And where we, one of the areas we work in in Nakuru in Kenya, it's quite high altitude and it gets really cold at night. And in the morning, and one night I was there and it was raining hard. And um, the tents that they had, they all have holes in them and these people, and, and just a mud floor. Um, there's nothing on the floor and that's where they sleep. So 
these people are leaning against the side of the tents trying to sleep during the night holding their babies and it was just the it was just absolutely out of this world that these people are going through that and yet I had just come on a plane from my comfortable home and bed and yet at the same time, that temporalness of it all, at the same time as we're living here, living our lives and getting our coffees and preparing our dinners, there are people on the other side of the world suffering extremely. And it is the injustice of that. It makes me angry. The inappropriately distributed wealth amongst the world makes me angry, uh, particularly with children and uh, girls and women that are suffering so much. Yeah, it makes me need to do something about it. And I suppose there was a point I remember as well. When I first walked through those IDP camps, I knew you kind of, kind of didn't have a choice anymore. I wasn't, I wasn't really choosing that life. I'd seen it and it was in my brain and I had the ability to do something about it. So I kind of felt then from that moment on, you don't really have a choice. <laughs> It's funny that you point at choices because I have been sitting thinking, for me, it feels like such a a deliberate, like I know that this matters to me and I can no longer, I'm not ignorant to this. I can see it with my own eyes. I've mm. experienced it. I know what needs to be done. Mm. And so for, it's funny that you describe it like, I, well, I just then had no choice because mm. it, it feels very like designed, like now, now I want to, now I need to do something. <laughs> like there was that pull. Yeah. And it wasn't that I knew what needed to be done, I wish, <laughs> in some ways. You know, I was very ignorant. I didn't have a development degree. I hadn't been in that space before. Maybe it was the mother in me as well, but just the human being. It was I, I didn't know what needed to be done. I just knew that I, yeah, it was in my head, those images. And there was probably, you know, as well, Bex, an element of, of ego you know I'll go in and save save the world and you know but I quickly discovered that it was the other way around I was going to get so much more learning from Africa and the communities and the people we work with they are a constant reminder about what life's all about for me and what's important Mm. Yeah. I feel I feel my eyes sort of welling up it's very touching and um and I'd love to know like then what has been the story? Because you got us to the start of where someone says to you, build a school, and I know that there's a lot more to the story now today and what you've been able to accomplish. So tell us, talk us through those steps along the way and where you are today. I went to a number of different IDP camps and some of them, most of them were absolutely horrendous because what they'd done is that they'd been given the tents by the United Nations and then the government, the Kenyan government said to them all, okay, enough of this after a year, go back home to the West where you've come from. But most of these people um, did not want to return because they didn't feel safe. They'd lost many of their loved ones. They'd lost all their resources. A lot of them were sort of middle-class plumbers, electricians, but they'd lost all of all of the materials when they fled. So what they did instead with the initiative that I do love about these people is that they picked up their tents and they collaborated and they, uh, because the government gave them $100, and they used that money to um, buy pieces of land collectively, which became known as these IDP camps. So I went to see a number of them, and most of them were on terrible pieces of land uh, with no waters, water access, with no sewage solution. Uh, one was on this big hill and they had a little stream down below it with the cattle uh, all through the stream and you know pooing in the in the water and the kids were drinking out of the water at the same time and young boys with sort of guns supposedly patrolling the places it was all very sort of anarchistic and not very promising um, and didn't feel very safe but then this one in particular gave me hope and it was the pipeline IDP camp which is where we we it all started from and they gave me hope because they, um, when I went to see them, I said how I'd like to talk to someone about how potentially we could work together. They brought this committee together that represented Kenya and they sat with me and they just presented me with this plan of, well, we know that two kilometres walk away from this camp is a five acre block of land that the teachers union own, Kenyan teachers union, um, and it's designated to be a public school. Can you work with us to build a school there for our children? Because the schools in the district are totally overwhelmed now that we've arrived, or well, they were to begin with, but now they're even more so. They were the first person, sort of first group from that trip that didn't ask me for food or money. They asked me to educate their children. And they were very clear. Moses, who's the chairman of that camp, who we still work with and is a very good friend, he said, none of us want to ask people to feed our children. And so it was very much that give them 
the fishing rod, not the fish um, that they knew about, and they had all that, that they had all that initiative. And so it sort of that really resonated with me. And so then I went, I gathered all this information, and I went back to Australia, and um, I talked to my good friend and neighbour Kerry Chittenden, and I convinced her to come on board. I'd created an entity when I did the first fundraiser. And so she came on as a director with me and then I took her back to Kenya and I, I took her to the sort of three places that I thought maybe we would work with and collectively we decided that it would be the Pipeline IDP camp because of their initiative and because of the impact we believed in of education to actually permanently empower the children that we work with. Yeah. I was going to say it's a gift education and yet in so many ways it's such a fundamental part of creating opportunity not just for ourselves but for our communities and for I suppose probably then for the country at large and so you set up this school in this place that's obviously I mean it's it sounds like they themselves were quite mm. quite future focused in terms of mm. and, and knowing what it is that they needed and how did mm. that kind of create the snowball effect to then know that okay this this is a really sound strategy now that we want to take out further yeah and it's interesting what you say about education because I I think when you grow up with it you take it for granted and I didn't go to Africa thinking education's the answer but 11 years on I absolutely know it is and I've seen it Whereas the communities in Africa and this IDP community that had absolutely nothing, absolutely knew education was the answer. They knew it was much more of an investment for them than asking for anything else, including money or food, and they were starving. And they were prepared to to, to live with that whilst they invested through us in education. And I see it every day. I mean, I have been over there and on a Saturday morning at six o'clock, we might pop into one of our schools and there will be seven to eight if not more kids that have hidden on a Friday night in the classroom so that they can wake up early Saturday morning and study for their exams and the concept of that happening where I'm from in Australia and New Zealand where kids can't wait to get out the door at three o'clock um, and, and I think that different value on education is because when you don't have it, you realise all the opportunities it gives you. And when you do have it, you don't, you take those for granted. How have you seen education be, you know, a huge differentiator? Because I know when we talked, when we spoke last, when we met, you talked about a lot about women and, and about uh, about young girls in particular. But I mean, what are some of the tangible things that you have personally seen through the investment mm. in education that have made a massive difference? Yeah, oh, there's so many stories about that from the the children themselves. So when we first started, when we first built, started building our first school and would talk to these very shy students, boys and girls, and you'd say, what do you want to be when you grow up as you do? And they would say farmer or maybe teacher, but sort of farmer, mother, teacher. Six to 10 months later, after being in school, they would say doctor, astronaut, you know, the whole attitude and vision of their potential just expanded hugely. I've got one beautiful little girl in one of our schools who on their jerseys in our, in our first Aberdeer school, we put their name on the back of their jerseys, we embroidered their ju- name on the back of their jersey. And um, when we asked her, you know, we said to her, Jacinta, we'll put your name on. She said, you need to call, you need to put Ben Suda on the back of my jersey. I was like, why? She said, she's a human rights lawyer and she's my hero. And she had been researching her, somehow heard about it. She she, she knew what So They Can was doing and she was interested in it. And then somehow through her mother, perhaps, she had found out about Ben Suda. And anyway, Jacinta's sponsor back in Australia, amazing Mm. family, ended up contacting Ben Suda. And she wrote, Ben Suda wrote Jacinta this amazing letter about how Jacinta inspires this hugely acclaimed international human rights lawyer and just just saying to her, I'll mentor you and we'll get you there. It was just amazing. So there's just oh. so many, yeah, stories like that. Fazul is beautiful. <laughs> and when you talk to him, when he was seven years old, I said, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be president of Kenya. And I'm like, oh, good on you. But now he's 12. He still wants to be president of Kenya. And when you sit him down, he's very serious. And I'll say to him, why do you want to be president of Kenya? And Last time he said to me, because I want to invite all the leaders of the world to my house and I want to teach them how to be a good person and a kind person. It's like, oh, my God. You know, they're just, oh. yeah, they just believe in themselves now. They have um, the kids, they they 
a lot of Africans, it's beautiful. They tell stories through dance and music and they've been through a lot of trauma and they dealt with a lot of the trauma. They would do these amazing dances for us um, in front of the whole school and they will be about a girl who's been sexually abused by her teacher and they will um, dance that out and tell that story and then the rest of their friends will come and they'll sort of, first of all, she'll get pregnant and they'll kick her out as happens and then they learn about human rights and they'll bring her back in but they so it's stuff that they're learning at school but then they would be expressing it through their culture of dance and um it's just empowering it's just it's making them believe in themselves and have the confidence to to say no to what's wrong um and achieve what they want to achieve uh, it, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm almost speechless, which for um, people that know me will know that's practically unheard of. And, and, and the whole way through, as you were describing, the listeners won't, won't know this, but you had the most enormous smile on your face as you were talking about kind of what this has meant. And so it, what is it for you that lights you up so much about this? Uh, yeah, I get inspired when I see people make the most of their opportunities, and no one does that more than children in Africa. They absolutely know that it's, it's a golden ticket and they will go to the end of the world to, to realise that and to make it happen. There is, So, yeah, I get inspired by that, the strength and their courage. I get inspired by their, their attitude. And I think, yeah, what really lights me up is st- stories or being with these people and hearing their situations that takes me out of the sort of the mundane trap that I fall into living back here in the developed world of complaining about what we don't have rather than focusing on what we do have. I met a, a man... <laughs> A number of years ago, we uh, some of the children in our child wellbeing program we supported. They used to live in a rubbish dump. These children, there's about a thousand of them, are living on this rubbish dump, and they're orphans from either HIV/AIDS or that Kenyan election violence that I talked about. And uh, you walk through this place, and it is somewhere that no one should ever have to visit, let alone child have to live in. Um, you see these tiny little kids, the age of you know my kids. Uh, that it was cold and they would be burrowing into the mounds of rubbish to get warm. Unfortunately, they put all the medical waste there as well. So there's needles and, you know, placentas wrapped in plastic and from abortion. It's this horrendous place that these children are are going through um, to try and find something to sell. And I can remember, and the kids are always smiling and amazing, And but I can remember one day I was there and there was this, massive hole big hole and I looked down there and then these kids were playing in this hole and this man was next to it and I kind of started talking to him and sort of said your children are down there what's going on and he sort of smiled and said yes I built this because my wife is dying and so I've had to dig her grave and it's whilst she's still alive it's a safer place for my children to play in and I just go oh, my God, this man has dug a grave for his wife who's dying. His children are now playing that in that. And yet he still smiled and said, but, you know, he found something to be grateful for, which was that his children are safe and alive and um, that he loved his wife. And I kind of go, my God, back home, the things that I complain about or worry about or stress about, it's just so irrelevant compared to what these people go through. So it's so grounding mm. and it just, you know, teaches you to be grateful for this, for, for what you've got really. Gosh, yes. And isn't gratitude just something that, that is so, so fundamental and so essential and so needed as well. And you talked about this, you did a TED, a TEDx talk on, and, and you talked a lot about this idea of emotional poverty and, and, and emotional wealth. What is the kind of message that you want people in these kind of very privileged places to to hear? What's the action that can be taken? What's the or what's the change that you'd like to see? Mm. I, I I want the definition and the concept of charity to be redefined and understood correctly. Mm. I don't want anyone to feel like they shouldn't have what they have. I think whatever we have got is an absolute gift and we should appreciate it. But I really want people to understand that you get such a deeper purpose and enjoyment out of life if you help others. 
or support others. And it doesn't have to be children in Africa. It could be animals or it could be the environment or whatever it is. But if you do something for someone else, it's an investment in your personal well-being. So this concept of charity being, you know, and that's how I probably started off, this sort of slightly ego, great white saviour coming in to save the world Again, it's kind of a a material thing that might make you happy for a minute and then it's not. Whereas if you actually invest in philanthropy in whatever form that is, the returns you get are so much deeper than that material wealth that you're than you're giving out. Um, so what what I want people to to really think about is how much is enough financially? How much is enough for you and your family? Because I firmly believe that there is, and there's been studies done on it, a chart around happiness. And if you have too much money, you go above the line, then you become unhappy because you become dis- disconnected from your community. You have a bigger house, you have big high walls, you don't need your community for things. So you don't have a community, you don't rely on them and you don't need to work or do anything. So you don't have much purpose in your life. But if you honestly work out how much material wealth is enough for you and then give the rest away I think people will find they're heaps happier (laughs) yeah and it's funny because reframing concepts has come up in so many of the podcasts that we've done and just like when you when you shift a perspective on a concept that you know if we've all thought that charity is very one-sided oh I'm uh, as you've described like oh I'm so I'm doing such a good thing I'm giving whatever this is and actually Mm. what how you've just reframed it and redefined also what it means to create meaning, to make an impact, to, for, for this purpose to be mm. bigger than yourself is, mm. as you've described, so so good also for us. Like it's it's this kind of mm. amazing uh, th- thing to do at the end of the day. And, ha- and so you've got four children. You've built this, inc- I mean, really, it's incredible. It's so inspiring. Um, and I know there's probably lots more that you want to do. I'm not take away from that. But how has this journey of really doing what you've just described and, and what, what you're urging others to do, how has that impacted your own life, your, the life of your children, the life of your family, the mm. life of your community? Amazingly, uh, my kids, and I do want to first say I'm very lucky that I get to talk about so they can, but I have surrounded myself by amazing people that do an incredible job um, and delivering our projects and raising money to deliver our projects. And um, so it's definitely not just me <laughs> in any way, shape or form. Um, so, but yeah, I, it has made an amazing impact in my life and my children's lives. I um, have four kids that are very aware of how lucky they are. They don't talk about it much because probably because when my eldest, who's now 19, was about five or six when I first started out I can remember tucking her into bed one night and man, she's such a big deep thinker and um and she looked really worried I said what's wrong you look worried she said mommy I don't know if I want to take over so they can when I'm growing up and I was like oh baby oh my god you don't have to don't worry about that she said it was like she's the weight of the world on her shoulders at five so beautiful so I've sort of I try not to sort of talk about it too much because I'd hate them to think that um, and they don't need to because we have so, so many amazing people. But they, I hear about it from little things. I go to parent teacher interviews, and the English teacher will say, "Have you seen the story that Tess has written?" And I'll go, "No," and I'll read this essay, and it will be describing her time when I took her to Africa, and she was her and Mia, her sister, were chatting with some of our girls from East Pocot, and um, they're the ones that we're trying to that, that, that suffer early child marriage and female genital cutting, and they are incredible girls. And they were the same age then. They were all about sort of 15, 16, and um, they are in one of our rescue schools. And Tess wrote the story about, and I remember the time because I was with them, and they were all chatting the girls and I looked look over at them they were laughing and you know leaning on each other's shoulders and I was kind of thinking oh my god the girls are the same wherever you live they're just teenage girls but then later that night Tess told me how then um, Mia her sister said to them oh so you're in boarding school so what are you doing for the school holidays do you go you go home to your families and what do you do and these girls without realizing the impact it would make on my girls because the last thing they would want to do is hurt anyone they said no, no no if we go home we'll be killed by our brothers or or our um, fathers for disobeying them and running away and going to get an education and it was just such a stark reminder of how 
their worlds are similar in some ways, but so very different in other ways. And it was the best lesson. I, I could tell them things about the work I do, but nothing will go in like them being there and hearing that from those girls. And they're writing essays about it at school that I don't know about. And they're talking to their friends about it and they're aware of it. So yeah, it's made a huge impact on my children. And I also think whilst I do often, particularly when I was able to go over there um, uh, and I'd feel terrible getting on the plane each time I left and leaving the kids, I think it's been really good for them. I think they are, they're, they're sort of more autonomous. They're quite independent. When I have every now and then sat down and said, is this all too much for you guys? Should I step back? They're horrified. They're like, what do you mean? So they can as part of our family. It's what we do. It's who we are. Don't you dare. Like, it's quite scary. I don't feel like I could now um, because it's so much part of who they are and uh, they're proud of their role in it, which they should be. So, yeah, it's brought a lot to my family. Yeah, it's funny because you said the word proud and as you were talking, I was thinking it sounds like there's a lot of family pride and a lot of really valuable learnings that 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 we all can, like I'm just thinking of my own children. Mm. How can I, you know, mm. how can they get glimpses into mm. into the, these experiences? Um, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm sort of sitting here, there's two questions that I really want to ask you and they're completely unrelated. So the, the first is, Quite often when I'm working with either individuals, when I'm coaching them or, or even, even sometimes organizations, one of the, one of the most common things that happen is people tap into kind of what their true purpose is, what their real vision is. And it's so big that it becomes overwhelming to the point mm. of inertia. Mm. And I'm sitting here listening to you and arriving in Africa. I've been to Africa. My husband's family were um, from Zimbabwe. And and I remember feeling so, in so many ways, so incredibly um, taken away by the beauty of the place, mm. by the by the potential of the of the individuals, of the people mm. there. The beautiful people, beautiful place, and yet also. There's so much that that uh, even as you've described, there's still so much that that you want to do. Still, and, and by the way, this is not unique to Africa. Like uh, you know, we've all got mm, mm. things that need to happen in the world, and 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 yet that can feel so big. That where do I even start, and how can I? And yet you have taken forward steps towards this. What is the muscle that you have built over time to break down these huge? goals this huge aspirations and and actually take intangible meaningful steps towards doing something about it for people that are sitting thinking well I'd love to tackle whatever but it's it's too big I can't I'm just one person yeah Uh, well I think um first and foremost it's probably ignorance I had no as I say I had no idea what it would turn out to be um or how much work was involved uh but but probably for people going I would just say, what keeps you awake at night? You know, what really, if you're thinking about the world, what is it that bothers you about it? What what pulls at your heartstrings? Is it children in poverty? Is is it animals? You know, whatever. Is it in the environment? And then I, I, I look around, you know, partnerships are amazing. We have just incredible partnerships with the organizations that we work with, including, you know, the government, other NGOs and other communities locally. You don't have to start something up yourself. Um, if you can partner with others. I ended up starting So They Can because I felt that I went to a number of different NGOs and offered my services and they weren't interested, which was fine. (laughs) They kind of just wanted money. Um, And I've never really understood that because I am so conscious that it takes a village to raise a family, so to speak. And man, the advice we've had from some very intelligent people, um, I I welcome all the time. So... um, I think don't look too far ahead. You know, if I had started sort of 12 years ago and gone, oh my God, I have to raise three and a half million every year and we've got to look after 45,000 in the community, 27,000 children, and we've got all these schools and we've got to go through deep fat accreditation. I I would have gone, no way, that's way too hard. (laughs) I'm not going to do it. Just don't look too far ahead, but just do what you need to do to feel like you are walking in the right direction to make a dent in the area that keeps you awake at night. 
I love that you talk about emotional wealth, like tap into like what keeps you up at night. I always talk to people about go where there's energy, where there's where, mm. where you feel it in your body or you can't mm. help it because it's it's also informing a little bit. We're mm. so cerebral, we're so practical, yeah. we're so we're, we're so conditioned also. And yeah. yet there's information that is what lights us up. Where where does the energy flow? What is our emotional wealth as you've described, which I think is a fab fantastic term mm. like you know ripples make waves it's mm. it's it's incredibly inspiring and my other question that's been swirling around in my mind is yeah then how do you fit all of this into your life because it seems as though you've got so much going on I know that women get asked this question all the time it's not designed to be a gendered question but what is it that you how do you curate your life to fit all of these these components in and make it feel really whole and and yeah. fulfilled for you? Well, I don't do it well all the time, like whole and fulfilled. That's quite scary. I don't always feel like that. I probably feel like that when I'm running or in the mountains or in Africa or working on a project that we're developing and you're getting the tangible stories. Secondly, someone, the chair of my board once said to me, what's your strength? I hate that question. But what's your weakness was the good one, first of all. And I said, I care too much what people think about me, which was interesting. I never really thought about it before and it just came out. It's true though. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, he said, what's your strength? I hated that question. But I realized actually my strength is I surround myself with good people. So don't do anything alone. <laughs> Find the right people around you. And it might take a while and you might go through some, but um, yeah. So I surround myself by really good people who take a, do a lot of the load. You know, that's what I was trying to say before. It's definitely not just me. And I have an amazing team that just create the most amazing work. But I'm also very structured. So I have always been a bit of a planner and I have my timelines and I'm very strict on, you know, I've worked from home for a long time, but I have a diary that I stick to. And if I decide that I need more time for me I will put that in my diary like so so I need to run I need to get outside and so I'll make sure I do that um, in the mornings and there's a set time so uh, my very gorgeous intelligent wise mother said to me once that um, you know that you have a basket and it needs to have three eggs in it you know it's that whole it's you it's the family and purpose you know and making sure that they're balanced is the key and uh, yeah, I often get pretty out of balance uh, with work. I delve into that too much. So I think you're right. Taking the time out to look back and just analyze that and the balance is important. And, and again, if people start doing what they love and following their passion, then that you time as well, it, it can be duplicated in what work or you, you know, like I remember being in Africa uh, the last time I was able to be there at the end of 19 with some of these girls from East Pocot and I just had the afternoon with them and they were all telling their stories which were horrendous but there was this camaraderie and this feeling you know when they said you know can you can you be our voice can you tell our stories and when you say what are the moments that make you feel connected that that was those moments that are important for me that make me feel connected as a human being to other human beings that's what I loved about my medical law work that's what I love about this work it's that's what inspires me and motivates me is when you feel that connection to another human being and you feel that oneness concept and there's a beautiful African philosophy it's, it's Ubuntu U-B-U-N-T-U -U, Ubuntu and Nelson Mandela referred to it as the essence of being human and Archbishop Desmond Tutu spoke of how our personal um, well-being is so deeply connected to the well-being of others and that's that Ubuntu concept and every now and then you feel it with you know my, my teenagers felt it with those girls I feel it when I'm over there with the community when the I turn up and the woman starts screaming around the village oh Cass you've got fat and it's like a celebration and it's awesome and it's just I don't know it's just this yeah for, for me it's that feeling of, of humanity and we're all in it together yeah, it, it, you can feel that. You can, I can feel that throughout this conversation, that sense of connection, humanity and the importance of people and making a difference. And and you're doing something about it. You are living your purpose and it's incredibly inspiring. Um, I mean, really, it, the more that I hear about the work that you're doing and, and get to know you, I just think 
Gosh, I mean, wouldn't what well, I would certainly love to live a life like that where I create that kind of legacy, but I'm but it's very powerful because as you've described, it's just about doing what you can and going yeah. where you're passionate and purposeful and it doesn't have to be convoluted and and yet at the same mm. time you can make a really big impact in the world as you are. Yeah. I think so. And I, yeah, don't don't get too far ahead of yourself. Yeah, just go. Uh, and I didn't know that at the time. I literally thought I was going to continue doing my medical legal consulting and this would be something I did on the side. So I didn't have to make big decisions about anything. I just kind of went, well, I can do this now, so I will. And then I can do this tomorrow and then I will. And then when you get to a point where you can't, then you have to reassess that and you have to look after yourself. It sounds like you were, were confident enough to trust yourself and to give yourself permission to do that. Because for some people, they would see that as a huge shift, like a, bas- a massive leap to say, I've been doing this. This is what's known to me. This is what I've, this is the path that I've forged. This is what people have also expected of me. And now... And now this is what I want to do. So if you were just saying that just felt like a natural step for you. Well, there's two things. First of all, I firmly believe in Carpe Diem, seize the day, regret what you don't do, life short. <laughs> so worst that can happen, I try it, it's a disaster. I go back to what I was doing. Secondly, I was lucky and I'm very, very conscious that other people aren't as lucky as me to be in a situation where we'd moved to Australia and I decided I wanted a career change and I had a husband, ex-husband now there who could financially support myself and the children to do that career change. So I was lucky to have that. And saying that I was looking, you know, I was looking after the kids full time and stuff as well. And I think you can, it doesn't matter if it's five hours a week, 10 hours a week, you know, you can, you can start somewhere with a job as well and what you're passionate about and see what develops, you know, it was I'm conscious that I was lucky, but I also just am such a firm believer and you regret what you don't do. Added to a community that had asked me to help them and I had the ability to help them, you know, not from knowledge or anything other than I was connected to a world where I could generate funding um, and they weren't because of where they were born. So they're kind of three pretty strong drivers for me. And just, you know, just God, don't be afraid to fail, you know, making decisions out of fear or what if I, it doesn't work or what if I don't have enough money or what if I lose this job and, and, and my reputation is different. You know, who cares? Most people, if you jump out of a high, high-powered career and go and do what you love, everyone is going, God, I wish I had the courage to do that. <laughs> so don't worry about what they think. Yeah, it's it's amazing how much that that narrative can stop us about what other people think, and yet, um, a that's not really the marker, is it? It's really at the end of the at the end of the day, you're going to be thinking about what you have or have not, as you've described, done in your own life, and that's really what should mm. drive you. And then the other thing, as you say, everyone is focused, it's got their own stories that they're telling themselves, yeah. so they're too they're too busy focused on what they're not doing or what they are doing. Or, yeah, I know. Gosh, well, it would it, it's another thing of of how we can really start to untap our potential collectively, and especially as women, if we stop worrying about that if we stop trying to validate ourselves through other people and just Mm. doing the things that really light us up yeah any any like I I want to give you kind of this opportunity to to kind of share how people can get involved or how people can support the work that you're doing or any final thoughts or comments that you want to make at this stage for those that are interested in education and empowering children through education some of the neediest children in the world Um, and that might be interested there are so many ways you can help you can sponsor one of the children that we're speaking about you can sponsor a family which generally has about six or eight children and that supports them to go to school and the families to create income generating activities to get them out of poverty as a family so they can send their children to school themselves you can become part of an education collaborative of 40 people who sponsor a whole school um, and then you're directly connected to a school and I will sort of talk with that collaborate that group of 40 around our project plans and what we're doing and the results that you're very tangibly connected with all three of those areas actually obviously so from from a funding point side of the business um, donations anything like that is phenomenal the other side the implementation side of the business anyone that might be listening to this thinking actually I'm an educationalist or um, I'm a marketer or whatever it is and I'd like to get involved I'd like to be involved in the organization 
love to hear from you. Always want the wisdom of others, really. So we're just um, launching our inaugural, we're calling it One Human Race campaign um, for the month of March. And it's in response to those girls in East Picot that asked me to be their voice. And it's also in response to, to my desire to connect emotional and, and material wealth and those two different worlds I live in. So it's um, challenging people for their own personal wellness to run, walk, swim, whatever they choose, whatever discipline they choose, move 85 kilometers over the month of March for the 85% of our girls that get sold, cut and sold before they're 13 years old. So it's called One Human Race. It's on our website. You'll see it. So they can.org slash one human race with a number one. And you can sign up. We've got about 150 people doing it um, at the moment. And you could sign up to that and spread the word and help us. We're trying to generate $85,000 from that. And we're at 30000 at the moment with 150 people. So hopefully we'll get there. But then back to that personal thing of me, just for everyone to ask themselves what's, what's enough and what can I get involved in that will ultimately make you realize how much wealthier emotionally your life is for doing so perfect what one human race um and and or getting involved in other ways i think that's um fantastic a fantastic initiative and um and and also just a really important message for everyone to know yeah, yeah. Our one human race yeah um well, Cass, so. thank you so much for oh, being thank here you today. I'm, you know, I, I feel very inspired um, and and I just really want to thank thank you for all the stuff that you're doing and for hopefully being, and I'm sure you already have been, but continuing to be kind of a beacon for people that are thinking that they want to do a little bit more. So much okay. appreciated. Thank you, Bex. That's lovely. I always love talking about Africa. So thanks for indulging me. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today for another episode of Not Just Anything for Women Who Want It Whole. If you enjoyed our discussion, be sure to subscribe to our weekly podcast and leave us a review. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here with us and we look forward to having you join again. And remember, be brave, be whole, be you.